Primitivism is a philosophy based upon the destruction of human civilization, and is therefore the complete rejection of any manner of human ethic. It is most notably advanced by Ted Kaczynski, and has for far too long been allowed to thrive and receive praise from various online edgelords. These commentators will often spout nonsense about how Ted was actually right about many things. It is the goal of this video to demonstrate that the philosophy of primitivism, in all its forms, is ethically and economically incoherent in its anti-human beliefs. Primitivists make three main arguments. First, they say that the hunter-gatherer lifestyle wasn't as bad as people make it out to be. Second, they contend that civilization has a negative impact on the environment, making it immoral. Third, they say that civilization causes a loss of liberty and autonomy. This video will address all of these and more, so make sure you stick it out to the end to really round out your understanding. I promise it won't be boring. In his economic magnum opus, Man, Economy and State, Rothbard describes technology as recipes a man used to determine how to use means to arrive at ends. For instance, if Robinson Crusoe knows that using a net will allow him to catch more fish than otherwise, the knowledge of this and how to build such a net would be a technology that he possesses in his mind. The actual implementation of this would be in the form of creating the capital good of a net. Capital goods are those goods that man uses to attain other goods. For the case of a fish, the net is a capital good that gets him a further capital good in the form of raw fish that he may then combine with capital good of a fire to create the consumer's good, cooked fish that he may then enjoy directly. In the above example, the raw fish and the fire may be classed as first order capital goods, as they are one step removed from the consumer's good. The net, on the other hand, is a second order capital good, as it is two steps removed from the consumer's good. In a large division of labour, many higher order capital goods are used in the production of many different consumer's goods. The level of development of a given society is best seen as how high this hierarchy of capital goods rises. Primitivists detract from this standard economic knowledge. They draw a distinction between technology and tools. As John Moore describes, the primitivist sees a tool on the one hand as an object made by a single individual, or the cooperation of many individuals on a single occasion, and on the other hand, technology as objects produced by large-scale interlocking systems of extraction, production, distribution, and consumption. I think this is best translated into sound economic terms as tools being lower-order capital goods and technologies being higher-order capital goods. Moore explains that the primitivist is against only technologies and not tools. The primitivist contends that the large-scale systems that higher-order capital goods give rise to gain their own momentum, such that individuals have no control, nor even any understanding of them. This begs the question, however, of how high order must a capital good be before it transitions from tool into technology? If this is a continuum problem where no hard-set line can be found, I ask what exactly is the principal difference between a lower order and a higher order capital good? It's certainly the case that different men are able to understand the capital structure to different degrees. Is it that the second you are no longer able to understand all of the cogs at play in the division of labour that it becomes impersonal and thus immoral to engage with it. That would be the complete rejection of the very purpose of the division of labour, its remarkable ability to allow men to specialise into those tasks that they are best at, allowing everyone to benefit from their superior efficiency. It is from this note that the only coherent framing of anti-technology is anti-capital goods, that we arrive at what makes primitivism an apocalyptic ideology. But before I go into that, I ask that you hit the like button if you want to see more takedowns of evil ideologies. So, an apocalypse is simply a mass breakdown of capital goods. Consider any apocalypse story you have ever read or any movie you have watched. The character of what makes it an apocalypse is not mass death or scary monsters or anything like that. It's the breakdown of the capital structure that has allowed the civilization to thrive and thus fall upon said breakdown. Station Eleven is the perfect example of this. It's a story about a pandemic that wipes out over 90% of the world's population and focuses heavily on the aftermath of this event. You see characters walking through ruined cityscapes and throughout the show this is contrasted with an entire B-plot detailing the life before. It is often the case that many humans do die in such tales, but this is not the essence of what makes an apocalypse. That essence is the breakdown of our very way of life, turning from a world of comfort and joy to one of scavenging and survival. It is also reasonable enough to reframe this as a mass breakdown of the division of labour, rather than as capital goods specifically, if you desire that is to maintain mass death in your definition of apocalypse. And under this, the conclusion remains, primitivism is apocalyptic. Audrey. The primitivist claim that human civilization is detrimental to the environment and thus immoral can be summarized as follows. There is an associated cost to the increased standard of living provided by civilization that 
comes in the form of damage to the environment, climate change, ocean acidification, deforestation, topsoil depletion, etc. This damage, they say, is an immoral action, and humans should not take from the environment for their own betterment. This is the crux of their anti-humanism, in the same vein of the conservation of subversion that has taken a hold of the environmentalist movement. Conservationism is the philosophy of preserving the non-human environment at all costs. True environmentalism realizes that the reason we care about the environment is because we are a part of it. It's a nakedly anti-human to ignore human well-being in your analysis of the environment. Moreover, this is why I denote primitivism as a non-ethic, as it completely ignores the issue that ethics is there to solve. How should humans live their lives? In short, a human ethic must satisfy two properties. First, universalization. It has to apply to all of mankind. And second, it must actually assure the survival of mankind, as there's no point in concerning yourself with what a human ethic should be if no humans are alive. Primitivism satisfies our first condition, but fails in the second, because to state that any taking from the natural world by men should not be done is to call for human extinction. It is impossible to advocate such a thing, as it would be negated by its very advocacy. To argue that humans may not appropriate anything from nature is to argue that they may not act, as all men require that they must be able to appropriate scarce nature-given goods such that they may implement them as means. It is obvious that not being able to appropriate anything from nature locks one in a standstill. They cannot eat as that would require appropriating food, they cannot breathe as that would require appropriating air. Heck, even by simply standing, they are appropriating that standing room, making it an impossible ethic to comply with in the first place. Finally, I shall go over the various areas listed above and see how much it is the case that any of those issues are related to society itself, or rather the destructive effects levied against society by the state. First, climate change. This is the favourite disaster of watermelons across the globe. The associated danger with it is monumentally overstated by those with utterly no understanding of economics, as Schellenberger explains. Scientists have a similarly negative reaction to the extreme claims made by Extinction Rebellion. Stanford University atmospheric scientist Ken Caldera, one of the first scientists to raise an alarm about ocean acidification, stressed that while many species are threatened with extinction, climate change does not threaten human extinction. MIT climate scientist Carrie Manuel told me, I don't have much patience for the apocalypse criers. I don't think it's helpful to describe it as an apocalypse. An AOC spokesperson told Axios, we can quibble about the phraseology, whether it's existential or cataclysmic, but, he added, we are seeing a lot of climate change related problems that are already impacting lives. But if that's the case, the impact is dwarfed by the 92% decline in the decadal death toll from natural disasters since its peak in the 1920s. In that decade, 5.4 million people died from natural disasters. In the 2010s, just 0.4 million did. Moreover, that decline occurred during a period when the global population nearly quadrupled. In fact, both rich and poor societies have become far less vulnerable to the extreme weather events in recent decades. In 2019, the journal Global Environmental Change published a major study which found death rates and economic damage dropped by 80-90% to during the last four decades, from the 80s to the present. While global sea levels rose 7.5 inches, not 0.19 meters, between 1901 and 2010, the IPCC estimates sea levels will rise as much as 2.2 feet, not 0.66 meters, by 2100 in its medium scenario, and 2.7 feet, not 0.83 meters, in its high end scenario. Even if these predictions prove to be significant underestimates, the slow pace of sea level rise will likely allow societies ample time for adaptation. The other three ocean acidification, deforestation, and topsoil depletion are all trivially solved by private property rights in the oceans, forests, and soil respectively. If I am allowed to own a patch of ocean, I will want to keep it in good nick. Hard to get much money from a big vat of death where nothing can live. It is the fault of state forestalling of these public possessions that is the cause here, not any inherent flaw in society. The standard and correct view is that technology itself isn't per se bad, but rather can be used for either good or bad things. Primitivists respond to this by saying that there are inherent problems with technology, and that reforming civilization fails to address these fundamental problems. The argument starts by pointing out that civilization is based on the domestication of natural items, i.e. the natural world is reduced to a collection of resources for human use, which is correct and in fact a prerequisite of human action. Where the primitivist argument slips up here though, is in asserting that this domestication extends to humans as well. Just as domestic animals are different to their wild counterparts, they say, so too are humans. Humans are made into tools to sustain civilization rather than being autonomous beings. This makes no sense whatsoever. 
The key distinction between domestic animals and humans engaged in a division of labour is that the humans choose to engage in the division of labour and therefore must prefer it to the alternative. They necessarily benefit from this interaction by their own estimation. Primitivists further this argument by the use of the prefigurative principle, which states that the means used in some political struggle cannot contradict with the ends that you are trying to achieve, which I wholeheartedly agree with. They misapply this principle in stating that civilization is a means of dominating the natural world and that you cannot use a tool of domination to achieve achieve liberation. This, again, suffers from conflating humans and non-humans. Civilization is certainly a means of domination over nature, as much as that makes sense, but this is explicitly not a tool of domination over humans. Such acts of domination over others are status in nature. In other words, they are actively anti-civilization. As Hoppe has shown, the state, in its expropriation of productive individuals, engages in necessarily decivilizing activities. Namely, expropriation of producers, homesteaders and traders enacts a tendency away from production, homesteading and trade. This is precisely those activities that make up the division of labor and are therefore the cornerstone of society. To finalize the argument, I revisit the discussion above of the primitivist distinction between tools and technology, where it is stated that technology, as opposed to tools, gain their own momentum. Kane B gives the example of cars. Initially, when they were invented, it would seemingly give people more freedom, as they can now move about more easily, that is, they can better attain their ends. But over time, traffic laws had to be developed and car owners had to obey these laws, which it is contended is apparently a violation of freedom. To which I ask whether my freedom is violated if I agree to play by the rules of chess. Certainly not. It is my decision that I want to engage in this mutually beneficial interaction with another man. Similarly for cars, in a just society, all roads would be either privately owned or abandoned to nature. In the case of abandoned roads, there is no interaction, but also no rules of the road. So it's moot. It is only in private roads where just rules may be enacted, but this is an interaction with the owner of the road. Just as my rights are not violated by a woman refusing to have sex with me unless I buy her dinner first, they are equally not violated by a road owner refusing to allow me on his road unless I agree by certain codes of conduct on said road. To cap off this video, I open the floor to any supposed primitivists who wish to respond to me over the internet, possibly the most advanced technology known to man. Say, I wonder if that would violate some sort of prefigurative principle. Who knows? In any case, if you enjoyed, you have to watch this video where I provide a similar takedown of Minicus Thought, which will allow you to trounce those suckers too.